Hello, my precious treasure. Are you ready for story time? I have a lovely, dreamy tale to tell you. And I wouldn't want any alarms, rings, or other interruptions corrupting your attention. Are you very, very comfortable now? Good. Let's see if we can make your body even more cozy by taking some deep breaths and stretching. If you have enjoyed a lot of my audio art, you may find that consistently taking this moment to breathe in and out at the start of a hypnotic journey is becoming so associated with falling into trance for me that it is incredibly easy to let your body fall slack and loose and float down and away into my voice. Stretching out your legs, your back, your arms, your neck pulls you under as you remember the sweet relief of relaxing for me. Now that you've unwound your body, fall still and simply focus on your breathing. In a moment, I'm going to count five breaths, telling you when to breathe in and breathe out. With each breath, release deeper into trance, becoming more open and receptive more excited to just get to soak up my voice and drift in the fantasy world I will be creating for you. When you breathe in, take all the clearing light air steadily into your lungs, filling them to their comfortable capacity and holding without clenching until I tell you to breathe out. When breathing out, slowly release all of the air, emptying your lungs completely. Do that now so that you are ready to begin. One, breathing in deeply, falling more profoundly into trance, feeling your body flood with the buzzing energy of the oxygen. And breathe out, gently but firmly, letting go of everything. Two, emptying even deeper as you draw the breath in. Good treasure. Breathe out, peaceful and free. Three, warming contentment, filling you up as you inhale, blowing out completely, falling and falling and falling gently. Four, it feels so good to just follow my instructions and take a deep breath, and just as good to let it out now, giving in to the relief of compliance. Five, plummeting now as you inspire the dizzy mix of healthy vapors. Expire fully now, all sleepy, all dizzy, all mine to play with. Good treasure. Now let your breath slide into an organic, comfortable rhythm and slip out of your consciousness, just being soothed and complacent, open to my every word. In this session, 
I'm going to try something new for me and very relaxing for you. I'm simply going to tell you a beautiful story about an adventure and you are just going to fixate on my voice and the gorgeous fantasy images I'm creating through your aural and inner visual connections. It's good if the relief of just listening to me tell you a story takes you deeper and deeper into trance so that you feel sleepy, dizzy, dreaming. You will probably feel so much empathy with the main character of the story that as you drift deeper into your imaginative, dreamy trance, it will begin to feel more and more as though you are listening to me relate with pride an epic tale of something that happened to you. The more you feel like the protagonist, the more aroused and proud you will feel, the more aroused you are the deeper the sleepy, hypnotic charm the story will take you. The farther you surrender to the enchantment, the more you will be certain that I am talking about you specifically. The more you feel that you are starring in my story, the more you will realize that the tale is about you, personally, specifically, but crafted in symbols and metaphors. Epiphany after epiphany about yourself, about the ways I understand you, about the universe around you will occur, ranging from tiny clear candle flickers to fireworks of golden illumination. The more often you listen to this recording, the more the meaning of the story will become clear to you. While I am telling you the story, you are welcome and encouraged to shift around a bit for comfort and to touch yourself any way that you like while you focus on my voice and the adventures I will be describing to you. However, you must make it all the way through to the end before you have my permission to release. And if you're fasting for me or for another goddess, then of course you should continue to hold. But if you are otherwise allowed, I want you to register hearing those two words. The end as the trigger condition for letting all your built-up erotic tension explode, as well as waking you from trance. I'm doing a lot quickly here, but I know you will already have it if I go over that one more time. When, at the conclusion of the story I'm going to tell you, I say, the end, Two things happen. First, you have my permission to release if you are not fasting for me or another goddess. Second, you will wake up feeling the happy, satisfied exhaustion of a long journey well taken. Got that, clever treasure? Very good. Then just be loose and easy and enjoy listening to the fantasy I want to spin for you. Once upon a time, or a space, or a vision, there was or will be a very special young man. This lad had been born, and grown some, and played with toys or his peers. But he did not always dream as others see as others, feel as others. And always, for so long that he was surprised when he realized that no one else seemed to hear it, 
a radiant, ringing voice called out to him. The voice called out in the dawning of the sun that somehow looked like the harmonious tones transformed into light. He would watch if no one was around with glistening eyes and yearn for some way to be taken, possessed, devoted to something as beautiful as the sun, as compelling as the ever-present voice. The voice called to him in the waves of the sea, which he could never near without feeling the depths of its pull. His mad secret fear, although just a tiny one, was that the craving to be absorbed by a more powerful force would lead him to throw himself to the throbbing waters in sacrificial submission. The voice called to him when he was alone at night, soothing, caressing, relaxing, but never satiating his deep craving for more. An erotic pull developed that no amount of pleasant play could distract him from for long. Finally, he reached a point in his life where he needed to either, one, go questing for the voice's source. Two, commit himself to living a life, constantly ignoring the voice. Or three, fall entirely insane. And so he resolved to set out. While preparing for his journey, he went to see the local gypsy wise woman, the Shivani, although others claimed she was a fairy in disguise. So strong were her powers of foresight, so extensive her knowledge of herbs and lore, so powerful were her charms and potions. Now a good fortune teller will admit whether she knew you were on your way or not, or much about the ways and means of magic at all. She will simply spin you about with soothing tones, twisting questions, vague proclamations, and trust that your subconscious will use any excuse to work it out for you. She might mesmerize you, gaze into shiny props, toss runes carved on what only appear to be ancient bones. A good fortune teller is an airy creature of deep mystery. An epic fortune teller, however, is quite a different story indeed. The Shivani of this village appeared at first to be quite plump, but young and spry. Only the third turned out to be correct, however, because delicate thin limbs stretched out from her billowing sleeves and layers and layers of colorful shirts. She looked much younger than her lived years, because at a distance where wrinkles and age spots were invisible, it seemed impossible that any but a youthful body could move with such grace and energy. It was midday as he approached, and she stood over a front yard campfire, boiling something in a large iron pot slung from a wooden frame. He watched, fascinated, wondering what kind of potion or stew she was concocting whether it would captivate the mind, titillate the senses, send the drinker into a deep, fantastical sleep. It's too, she said, startled to be addressed, even as she continued to give no other clue acknowledging his presence. He began to stammer apologies. Not some tricksy gypsy potion, just broth, and vegetables, and meat, a few herbs, you know, stew, not magic. And you took your time coming by, didn't you? Well, you're started now, so you'll be wanting to eat before you set out, won't you? She deftly filled a huge bowl made of a glazed purple and blue pottery and handed it to him with a spoon. 
somehow also insisting on maneuvering him into a nearby chair with the most subtle of motions. When she had him situated, she sat down across from him and fixed him with her rich brown eyes, wordlessly communicating that if he were to stop eating, she would do something about it. You're here hoping I'll tell you you aren't crazy to go searching after something you can't touch or prove or show to a friend for validation. Well, I won't. Maybe you are and maybe you aren't. But I will tell you this. You'd be crazy not to go, wouldn't you? What do you have to lose that compares to what there may be some tiny possibility that you'll gain? Eat. Go. But wait until tomorrow. Swallowing his last bite of the delicious stew, and by now strongly intimidated, he managed to stutter, Why? Because, she said, smiling playfully, barely restraining a giggle, utterly devoid of malice. I lied about the stew. And you've got about 30 minutes to get somewhere safe where you can spend the night. I would invite you to ride it out here, but I'd fuck with you, and you really don't need any more of that to get ready. She grinned wildly, and had disappeared into her cottage before he finished processing what she had said. He stood quietly for a moment, considering pursuing her, and the entirety of the strange, brief encounter. He took a slow, deep, Calming breath in and out, then began the sprint back to his cabin in a sudden burst of accepting energy. Something was already pulling at him, tugging the web strings in his mind. His body moved without conscious volition in a direction of unknown consequence, but it was so hard to pay attention to resisting because another force worked on his awareness. Could the gypsy's magic already be working in him? He tried to focus on his path, on putting his right heel somewhere ahead of his left toes, and his left heel ahead of his right toes. He took a deep, grounding breath as a dizziness came over him, and he felt the path sloping downward. He released his breath slowly. His body grew wary, but he continued to let gravity guide him forward and down, forward and down. He fought against the dizziness, fearing the lingering effects of the Shivani's spell. All around him, strange sounds and images, confusing, battering, His mind swirled, and he struggled against the overwhelming urge to close his eyes and let go and fly apart into this strange place. He was spinning. His mind was spinning. His body was spinning. His spirit was spinning. He tried to pull in, to hold himself together so that he wouldn't dissolve, become undone. He strained to hold on to his ego, but the spinning was throwing everything around, and he was falling and swirling around and around, and now in the rain. He strained to resist, but he felt it slipping away, scattering. He was losing his grip, and the fear now pulsated inside him, crying of madness. But then, He became aware of a slight, buzzing tone, a small crystal sound from inside him, a spreading resonance from his very center. The sound pulled him into himself, and his awareness narrowed on the sound. Somehow, within the spinning, his center became calm, relaxed, Peaceful, opening widely and freely to the inner sound, soothed his fear 
that he would spin and spin, that he would be forever out of control. He surrendered to the sensation, and all of the discomfort stopped. The sound intensified, as though he were tuning into it, and he knew the sound was her voice, and the disorientation of the spinning was only caused by his own fears of failure, unworthiness, unlove. But her power inside him and the strength of his love sent him floating deeper into the center of himself. The spinning was around him, inside him, but he accepted the spinning, loved the spinning, because it was making him safe from his own fear, enclosing him in calm and her loving voice. He knew that, in a true sense, she was there with him. He felt her so close. He let go of his mind, because she was there, and her love was there, and he floated on the whirling energy as it carried him deeper still. He felt himself opening up wide to her voice and to her words as her love grew inside him and his loving trance deepened, his awareness expanded. He was moving on the path still, but now there was light and the path was firm and slightly curving. He felt his strength grow as his mind continued to simply follow her voice. There was no fear with the fall deeper but rather exhilaration and confidence, focused on her voice and feeling her love. His arousal grew, and the more he gave into it, the more he felt that flow of arousal energy that connected him with her. So aroused and so deep and strong and eager, he absorbed her words desperately. Her words were good and made him love her and fall deeper in love with her. Her words made him simply, blissfully happy. He heard her words as they entered his mind. He did not think about them, but felt them like soft caresses, like gentle touches in his deepest places now open to her. He spun and he floated down, and he loved, and he opened wide for her happy, strong words. He felt newly strong and free. He trusted his goddess from the depths of his essential being. He trusted in his love. This was a love that, even if it destroyed him to his last molecule, would have been worth the experience of even that one pure moment. What the rest of that night was like for him, it is difficult to describe. What is a self-actualizing machine elf anyway? But when he awoke, he felt as though he had been scrubbed out, not completely without a violence that had left him wrong, But everything in his energetic and subjective systems felt purified of lots of nasty feelings and stories that had built up over the course of his life. He felt ready and confident to take on any challenges he might encounter and to set out without ever regretting his chosen action. Having gathered all his supplies, he went forward without further delay. And so he traveled on, seeking his love every moment from when he woke to the time when he fell exhausted into a deep sleep every night, wherever he could make his bed. Time passed, and adventures, turns and turnings that would require hours and hours to fully explore. 
he was able to discover tales that had great evil, described in various horrific terms, was said to hold prisoner a beautiful and magical being similarly described in a variety of aspects, feeling with deep intuitive strength that this was the source of the voice he sought. He pressed until he was given directions to reach the evil's lair. He was warned that all of the knights, princes, mages, and other types who had set out on his quest had, if they returned at all, never recovered from the madness that had taken them along the way. In an attempt to find a cure, the local shaman had gone as close as seemed prudent to the lair and discovered the apparent source of the affliction, an enchanted maze surrounding the inner grounds completely. Neither defense against the maze's magic nor cure for its dire effects had ever been discovered. As the evil relied primarily on the maze for defense, its dwelling was not difficult to find. As the brave treasure crested a high hill, he was able to look down over the maze and examine the challenge before him. It rose in dark green hedges, covered in colorful flowers that belied its malevolent intent. As countless others had before, he tried to find and memorize a path through the maze. But as his gaze circled round and in and back to the left, forwards two slots before right, curving around, now into the left upper quarter for two turns. Without knowing at first what had happened, he woke up startled on the ground. Without having time to even notice what was happening, he had sunk down to his knees, then reclined and drifted off while trying to trace the maze even with his mind. Accepting that the magic of the maze prevented taking advantage from further reflection, he began easing his way down to the entrance. Upon reaching the opening of the maze, darkness had fallen, and he wisely and patiently lay down for a long sleep, the better to serve his goddess. He got quite comfortable on the soft, grassy ground, and let himself imagine that the continuous encouragement from the voice came from his goddess's lips just beside him now brushing his brow and telling him what a good, darling treasure he had been all along. When the warm sun and distant bird calls woke him, refreshed, energized, and knowing that he could do anything in pursuit of his voice, even what was impossible for others over this long time, and therefore he addressed the hedge maze before him. Tentatively, he stepped forward, sniffing the air. Something nostalgic could be tasted at the back of his tongue, and his legs sent him sprawling back in retreat before he understood why. At a safe distance, however, he realized that just that tiny intonation had left him dizzy and reeling the colors of the landscape shifting into fuzzy pastels. The taste of the gypsy stew came back to him vividly as he shuddered and began to quietly chant Matkechacha Sak Sampa Kasha until his head began to clear. Understanding that the beautiful flowers release the disorienting toxin he understood the madness others had experienced. He felt that he could withstand the effects for a while, and his intuition told him that his earlier experience would give him some tolerance others would not have had. But who knew how long it would take 
to pass through all the twists and turns, even if he did know the path. Calming himself, he kept chanting as he opened his mind up to the solution he knew must exist. Suddenly, an epiphany so simple occurred to him that he knew why it had never been tried. How could such an easy plan succeed? But he knew that it would. Confidently, he looked around and found two long, straight sticks on the ground. He laid them both at the maze entrance, pointing directly at the center. He tied a scarf tightly around his mouth and nose to reduce the toxic intake as much as possible. Then, drawing the sword his journey had never shown cause for before, he stepped forward and cut a path through the blocking hedge wall. He took one stick and aligned it with the end of the other so that both now pointed the way for twice the length. He cut more bushes, focusing on his chant and experience with the intoxication to keep him moving forward. He took the stick that was farther back and aligned it with the front end of the forward stick, maintaining the integrity of his direction. In this way, he moved through the otherwise devastating maze quickly and efficiently. You may wonder how the evil could have left such an unprotected loophole. But remember always this. Evil is both dumb and cunning. The tyrant within knew that seekers could be relied upon to fall prey to unconscious assumptions about rules to the game. However, it could never be expected to grasp the ingenuity inspired by passionate, adoring love. And so the clever treasure was able to ease his way through and come out on the other side in time to take deep, clearing lungfuls of fresh air. The castle did indeed lay at the center of the maze, a crumbling castle barely protecting a dark and terrible underground lair, most ancient as the earth's boiling heart, where the forces of selfishness, superficiality, banality, sadness and fear held dominion. In this castle, the most beautiful goddess Kasha had been held captive for a thousand centuries, frozen in time to be a source of beauty to limited others and never to herself. Without hesitation, the bold treasure strode into the cavernous dungeon to seek out his goddess. Following still the pull of the irresistible voice, which occurred with greater strength the nearer he was coming to reaching her. Forcing his way over every obstacle, he at last came to the room with an enchanted glass dome in the center, surrounded by crackling blue flames. Within the dome, like an oversized snow globe, stood the frozen goddess, her usually gentle smile strained with the force of the magical prison. Resplendent in a flowing white tunic with a sparkling pink cloak, her porcelain-hued skin looking like delicate china in fact. Untouchably gorgeous, robbed of all signs of life. He pressed forward, determined to attack the confines with all the strength he possessed, giving anything it might cost to free his goddess from her prison. But as his first blow was struck, it fell not on the glass, but the wicked claw of the lair's beast. This was the creature, created long ago in a dark pact as part of a great cost. This horrible thing with three heads, eyes of fire, and a thunderous stormy breath that fed on suffering, restriction, horror. 
This was the thing that could not bear glory to walk unchained, as though pleasure were offensive to its own pain. The combatant's eyes caught, and the beast glared down with a frightening burden of expectation. Fearing nothing now but to hold back from giving everything to the rescue of his goddess, the brave treasure lifted his eyes again to her face and saw a twinkle there he had not caught before. Immediately he understood what he must do, and he had learned by now not to question the will of the voice. As the beast turned in confusion for a moment, its cunning sentience aware that some information had passed beyond its knowledge, our protagonist made his most daring move. Letting loose his sword and sinking to his knees unprotected before the crystal cage, he began to chant, Matka Ichacha, Sak Sampad Kasha, with total devotion and focus on his love, knowing that no matter what happened next, in that moment his life fully reached a place of meaning and fulfillment. Joyfully he felt the beast's rending claws rake his chest as he began to fall into oblivion to the sound of shattering glass. Having passed through such terrible trials, fought hard and courageously against all of the evils that would have blocked his path, and fought even harder against his most intense fears, he lay broken in his moment of triumph. His wound was deep, and the many battles had consumed so much of his energy that he felt surely near death. But as he looked upward, he saw a brilliant light obscure all the darkness radiating from a warm, flowing center. With everything he had left, he chanted, Matka Ichacha Sak Sampad Kasha, and it resonated off the stone walls like a thousand-voiced choir. And then he slipped into total absorption by the light. Eons of floating, drifting, burdenless ease followed, soothing his mind and spirit, even as his body disappeared. Hot, teasing air currents drifted around and through him, easing and pleasing his every remaining tension. The voice was everywhere clearer than it had ever been before, gently purring things like deep healing trance for me, or a very, very good treasure. And over time, he became aware that the voice was no longer just inside him, but coming from outside him as well. And so he tried, successfully, to open his eyes. There he found himself laying in Goddess Kasha's lap, her arms wrapped around him, her sparkling green eyes gazing lovingly at him, her delicate fingers gently petting his sensitive skin. And for the first time he watched as her lips formed the words she spoke to him and her voice shimmered down like caressing feathers of light. Before we were one thing only, the power of love and the endless devotion without limit, and I remained imprisoned, helpless to move for my own sake. Your faith, my precious treasure, Putting yourself in the way of sacrifice for the sake of worshipping me. Your destruction I could not abide. And that was the difference in strength I needed to break from the cage. Now I am your goddess forever, and you will be my treasure. 
rewarded with the privilege to serve and obey me with your passion and desire, as you have, as you do, as you will with ever increasing intensity. As the epic treasure gazed up at his goddess, lost in her beauty and generosity, he knew that his life had been forever changed. He knew that, though having each other so strongly, the future brought all sorts of unknown delights and puzzles, times of many sorts would follow. But nothing would ever return him to the simple life he might have known. He lived in her eyes and was satisfied. And no more needs to be told for now. The end.